Good afternoon, everyone. Uh, happy Friday. My name is Lucy Gray, and I'm here hosting Actionable Innovations Conversations. Today, um, I'm joined by some special guests that I'll introduce in a moment. But I would like everybody, if you're joining us here in um, whether you're on YouTube or LinkedIn or in Hop In, I would love for you to introduce yourself in the chat and tell us who you are, what your role is, where you're from. Um, and just let us know that you're here because that really helps us um, gauge who's the audience and that sort of thing. So this is Actionable Innovations Conversations. We're part of an organization called Actionable Innovations Global. And what we do is we do a lot of different things, but we've really kind of focused in the last year on connecting and empowering education-focused professionals around the world through international professional learning and networking opportunities. And our aim is to change the world by providing meaningful and impactful learning experiences for all learners in support of the UN sustainability goals. So um, we do a lot of different things. We host a lot of events. Uh, we just hosted an AI conference online in Hopin and uh, that went really well a couple of weeks ago. And our next event is an international conference that we've done. It used to be called the global, really spectacularly titled the Global Education Conference. <laughs> and now it's called, uh, we've kind of rebranded it and retweaked it. It's now called GLOW, Global Learning for an Open World. And we do this during the International Education Week around the clock to accommodate time zones. And the call for proposals is open now. So if you're interested in sharing your ideas uh, with others, it's a, a pretty interesting conference with, um, you know, we have keynote speakers, but it's also really kind of inclusive and, and uh, you know, anybody who wants to uh, present usually can, um, as long as you're kind of tied to our mission. So that call for proposals will be going uh, on through November 1st. And um, if you have more, if you want more information on it, we're going to be doing our next actionable innovation conversation in September on how to um, get involved with GLOW. So there'll be more information coming forward. And I see that Jennifer Klein is here. Yay, Jennifer. Jennifer is in Colorado and she's presented and keynoted at GLOW uh, over the years. She's an amazing educator and we're glad to have her here today. So yay for Jennifer. Um, so if you want to get more connected with us, uh, if you're interested in what we're doing, uh, you can find us on Linktree slash Actionable Inno. We have an online community. We write on Medium. Uh, we're on social media as well. And you're always welcome to join us in any of these spots and, um, you know, connect with us around educational innovation. Today, I would love it for you to, I would love everyone to introduce themselves in the chat wherever they are. If you want to use your LinkedIn profile or your Twitter account to connect with other people, feel free to throw that in the chat as well. And uh, the whole point of this is really to kind of uh, illuminate interesting organizations and ideas and connect people so that they can build their professional learning networks. I think it's really important post pandemic, if we are post pandemic, to kind of re-inspire and reconnect um, in the field of education. So that's really our primary goal here. And I see that we have somebody in Canada, Dunja. Thank you. Uh, some A parent of an autistic child and working with autistic children. Awesome. That's wonderful. Glad to have themselves. you here. Yeah, that's great. Wonderful. We're so glad to have you here. And Megan is here too. All right. Look at this. Oh, I'm so excited to have you all. Welcome everyone. Um, so um, without further ado, I'm going to introduce our guest speaker and I'm going to read his bio. So bear with me uh, because I think it's important for you to know everything. And then we have a special mystery guest here today. So uh, Dr. Adam Lawler is the Vice President of Neurodiversity Research and Innovation at Vermont's Landmark College. Landmark College is a community designed exclusively for students who learn differently, including students with learning disabilities such as dyslexia, ADHD, autism, or executive function challenges. Dr. Lawler will share information today about Landmark's programs for neurodiverse learners, as well as its research efforts. He received his PhD in Ed Psych from University of Connecticut, and with more than 15 years of experience in higher ed administration, his research focuses on post-secondary transition and success of college students with disabilities. Broadly, Dr. Laylor 
focus, focuses on raising awareness of post-secondary opportunities for individuals with disabilities, including disability within the discourse of diversity. He presents and serves on the editorial boards of career development and, tr and transition for exceptional individuals and the Journal of Post-Secondary Education and Disability. He is the author of numerous articles and book chapters, and he uh, co-authored a book that I will put the link in uh, the chat from disability, um, from disability to diversity. And I will put that in the chat so that everybody can get a chance to look at the book. So um, thanks for coming, Adam. And uh, who is the special guest that we have here? Do you, you know this person that's also in the, in the room? Absolutely. The more important person in the room, I say. <laughs> So, so, uh, so the reason I asked Adam to be here is that um, uh, Julia Gray that you see here is my daughter, and she is a recent Landmark graduate. And we were in, we were bowled over at graduation when Adam came up to us at a reception and said, "I loved working with your daughter. She's great." And lo and behold, Julia got an award. Uh, Julia, do you, uh, for her research with Adam and, and Julia, can you, can you tell us a little bit about, um, your work and, and what you've done with Adam so far? Yeah, sure. So hi, I'm Julia. I graduated with my bachelor's in psychology this past December from Landmark. Um, I worked with Adam this past semester, uh, fall 2022 as, as a part of the research mentorship they have at Landmark College where you're students can sign up and do like a research project focusing on, I guess, really anything, but we chose to focus on neurodiversity at, in higher education, specifically what we noticed, me and my three other co colleagues, um, we noticed that there's a much more higher, not really incident, but like there's a lot more um, interruptions that we we experience as neurodiverse learners in college classrooms, especially with other students. So we kind of focused on that and see how like our experiences compared to other people in uh, at Landmark too. So that's a, what we kind of focused on. So, yeah. And what did you find and what were your findings? It's still going on. Oh, really? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. Some of the initial findings that I, that I can share are that, um, there's some differences uh, amongst the different profiles of students that we have. Landmark uh, has students with learning disabilities, ADHD, and autism. And uh, but frankly, they, they all see the experience a little bit different. Um, and, but one of the things that, one of the really interesting findings that we have going on, that we're, that's emerging, is that um, many of our students are aware that they can be distracting. Um, to other students in the class, they're just not aware of what they can do about it. Oh, um, interesting. So, uh, I mean, we were uh, we sort of uh, compiled some ideas of things that could that uh, students could do in order to address what they know is happening. Um, so it's uh, it's exciting because I mean, like Julia, it's uh, she's bringing a level of expertise not only in research but with her experience. I mean, she can see things that are going on from her perspective, which is one that can be shared by others. I see it from my own perspective. And together, we can bring all those, uh, our perspectives together to try to figure out a way to make the learning environment better for all. So I'm going to take this away so we can actually see each other a little bit more. And let's dig into this a little bit more. Um, Julia, tell us a little bit about um, how you ended up at Landmark and and what the experience was like as a student. So I graduated high school in 2017 and mm -hmm. I was initially, I initially, when I was like applying for colleges, I think my therapist and several other people have recommended Landmark. Um, but I was like, kind of, I didn't want to go because I was so set on the school that I was, I wanted to go to. Um, it's Laura's College. I ended up going there for two years and I was a part of the division, the NCAA Division Three swim team. So that was always fun. Um, but I didn't do well as I, well, the, like the transition from college to, um, from high school to college was difficult. I I didn't really have like a good foundation for for learning or like how to like learn in college as someone with who is neurodivergent. Mm -hmm. And so that kind of like, I failed a couple, I failed several classes 
and it was not my proudest moment, but in May 2019, I decided to go to Landmark. So I applied for Landmark and then I got in and then, yeah, it took me, it took me a while to figure out mm -hmm. how I learned at Landmark. Obviously with the pandemic that was going on and doing a semester online at home, that was difficult. But I think end of 2020, beginning of 2021, I kind of started figuring out what works best for me and how I learned better and actually started taking classes that interested me. Interested me. So like we have a class called, um, I don't know, I can't remember the exact title, but it's basically kind of, it's learning disability seminar. So you learn about all these learning disabilities and like, like the profiles that people can fit into it. And it's kind of like all a spectrum. It's really interesting to learn it as someone who is neurodivergent and is also interested in helping those who are neurodivergent. So yeah, I think that kind of kickstarted my, my uh, passion for helping those with who are neurodivergent. And then, yeah. So I, I remember as a parent, Julia, like after your first year at Loris and I, and, and Loris had a center for, for kids that, on the spectrum and who with learning disabilities who, who needed more support. But I, I didn't find the person that you worked with. Um, I think Very helpful. Right. He kind of did blame me for not being. There was a, I, I, it was a little, there was a little frustration. I, I, I'm not sure how well she understood what happens when somebody is, is struggling. And, um, and I think there's a certain amount of compassion and uh, kind of uh, problem solving that needs to happen when, when somebody's not successful, like let's get to the root of the problem. And there was, and I, I, I so there was some frustration, I think for all of us in that regard. Um, and I said to you after your first year, I said, how about this, this landmark place? Cause I'd heard about it. I'd heard about the high school, I guess, yeah. um, years ago. And, um, and you're like, no, I want to stay. And, and you had a, and you right. you had a great time uh, on the swim team and you had friends and it was a, there were a lot of good aspects about your first couple of years of college. You learned yeah. how to, to, how to be more of an adult, yeah. but then, you know, we, the, the landmark transition happened really quickly. I remember like it was within like a month that we were applying <laughs> and we got you there and, um, and now your brother is there too. So we're about to take Henry back and, you know, hopefully he'll have the same kind of, you know, positive experience that you've, I think he already has, um, but he'll continue to grow like you did, Julia. Yeah. Yeah. It was great spending my last semester with him. Yeah. 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 His first semester, my last semester. So. Yeah. I think the other nice thing about Landmark too, as a parent has been, um, it's a small community. I think for Henry, you know, I can't speak for him entirely, but I think for him being in a small community where people are looking out for him has been a big part of the the, the positive experience for him. Um, so Adam, tell us, how did you end up at Landmark and, and, and what do you do there exactly? Yeah, it's, uh, my, my story is a bit interesting because yeah. this is actually my second time at Landmark. Oh, really? um, yeah, I started at Landmark uh, initially back in the early 2000s. It, I started working there in a very different capacity. I, I uh, was running one of the residence halls um, uh, Stone Hall, and I was serving in the capacity as a resident dean or uh, someone that oversaw, uh, I mean, the residential experience of students and supported them in uh, learning strategies and skills outside of the classroom. Um, and I fell in love. I, I fell in love with our students. I fell in love with the community. I fell in love with the how the education happened. Um, but at that time, I was really thinking, you know, I, to be able to do an even better job, because I didn't learn any of this in, <laughs> in high school or in college, uh, I had to go get more education ah. to do a better job. So uh, I left and uh, pursued uh, my master's and later on my doctorate while working uh, part time in various uh, higher education capacities. And as soon as I got uh, that PhD in hand, uh, I pointed my car towards Putney, Vermont, and uh, headed back uh, as uh, a member of, L of the Landmark College Institute for Research and Training's Research and Training Division. Um, so that's how I got it speaks there. volumes. Like, oh, like yeah. A, Once and, and a shark, it's, only the shark. 
<laughs> yeah, yes, yes. And, and the shark is there is your uh, mascot because sharks never stop swimming, right? It's always Absolutely. always keep swimming. I love swimming, that. I think it's awesome. and, and always keeps moving. That's awesome. So, um, so what does your institute do in your role? What are yeah. the kinds of things that you do? And I'll, I'll get the link for that up too. Absolutely. So in my current role, I, I serve as the vice president for neurodiversity research and innovation, um, as well as uh, I currently have the opportunity to serve as the college's uh, director of our Center for Neurodiversity. And the division that I oversee uh, can, is comprised of uh, four different departments. One I mentioned already, the Landmark College Institute for Research and Training. Uh, and we do uh, applied research um, in the area of neurodiversity and uh, education predominantly, um, but increasingly work related to um, the workplace and supporting uh, neurodivergent folks there. Um, we also do a, a tremendous amount of outreach uh, in the form of professional development and training. Uh, I, along with my team, are constantly traveling around the country, uh, sometimes internationally, to help educators, help uh, at both the secondary and post-secondary levels, uh, to support businesses and corporations wow. who are trying to really do better for uh, individuals with learning disabilities, ADHD, and autism. So we'll go out for sometimes half a day, sometimes multiple days to uh, provide the information that they need to in order to provide quality experiences. We also offer uh, a certificate program, a uh, post-baccalaureate mm -hmm. master's level certificate program in learning differences in neurodiversity. And it's an online program that has both asynchronous and synchronous components. And uh, I mean, we have folks who will uh, engage with others from around, frankly, from around the world uh, to learn about topics such, such as executive function, uh, autism online and on campus, and uh, most recently, post-secondary disability services. Um, so we do, we do uh, those types of things. We also do a variety of events uh, each year. Um, our Summer Institute for Educators mm -hmm. is held every June. It's on campus in beautiful Putney, yeah, Vermont. Yeah, yeah. Um, so folks, I mean, everyone always, always hears about the winter and the fall <laughs> in Vermont, but the summer is nice too. Um, yeah. Just don't it's come beautiful. during the season. <laughs> Um, so we have that event that's geared towards educators, uh, and then we have our uh, Workplace Neurodiversity uh, Summit, which is uh, held online oh, yeah. in February, which is geared towards um, workplace-related issues. Oh, I didn't know about that. That's news to me. Okay. That's, yeah, that's a new that's one. Okay. Okay. So you're busy. I mean- Oh, Yeah. <laughs> It seems like, and especially at, you, you, you hear more and more about neurodiversity in the workplace yeah. and people are being more, are embracing it more as they incorporate DEI into their, their businesses and places of institutions of learning. Um, what you mentioned earlier before we, we were on air that you've been writing a lot about this sort of thing, about what people need to do in, in order to support neurodiverse learners. Do you want to point us to anything on about that topic at all? Yeah, it's uh, there's increasingly we're, we're looking at this uh, idea of workplace and how we can support neurodivergent employees. And Landmark does a great job of post-secondary education. But we realize that they're not... We, we hope our students are not here forever. We hope they go on to new and bigger things in their lives and have uh, uh, satisfying lives outside of the campus, uh, the campus borders. Um, but we recognize that, frankly, a lot of employers are not prepared to bring on uh, uh, students like ours and uh, neurodivergent students more broadly, um, and really make the environments uh, successful for them. Um, they, they need to make some changes. And it's not just providing accommodations. They really need to change the culture and how they do things, how they think about employment. Because uh, unfortunately, we know that neurodivergent people tend to be uh, more likely to be unemployed or underemployed. Um, and they have tremendous talents that they can bring, skills that constantly blow my mind. Yeah. <laughs> 
and every day um, that frankly they're missing out on. Um, we have some I have some colleagues uh, that I've worked with over the years uh, from Microsoft and EY and JP Morgan that have constantly referred to uh, I mean, neurodiversity and the workplace initiatives as really a business imperative. Um, if, if we do not bring this population of uh, people into the workplaces more and more, um, we're going to lose out um, as not only as a business entity, but as a society. Um, so we're doing a lot more work in that area. Um, and I've been partnering with one of my colleagues, uh, uh, Kelly O'Ryan, um, the former Dean of Students at Landmark College, uh, who is now uh, principal at uh, one of our local high schools. And we've been working uh, in the area of developing supervision models uh, for uh, supervisors in industry and education to really serve and best support uh, neurodivergent uh, people in the workplace. Um, it's a model that we developed is based on two primary uh, uh, mindsets or philosophies, frameworks, whatever you want to call them, mm -hmm. uh, being universal design for instruction and learning and a supervision style called synergistic supervision, which really talks about um, the supervisory be experience being uh, co-created by supervisor and uh, supervisee in order to maximize uh, outcomes beyond what they could individually achieve. Um, so that it's uh, that's the new framework that we're talking about more frequently uh, and uh, bringing out to various conferences and uh, publishing uh, I mean, in various books. So, so Julia, you know, speaking of supervision, I know you have to go to work soon. Um, is, is there, you're working for a large uh, grocery train that will shall remain anonymous, I guess, for purposes of broadcasting. How do you feel that they do, do you see anything in the workplace where you are in terms of, of being aware of neurodiversity and accommodating neurodiversity? Uh, not amongst my coworkers really, but I do often encounter people who like customers who are neurodivergent and that kind of like brings me like a, like a, like a, like a connecting point. We're supposed to connect with our customers and kind of like talk with them and thing and just kind of, and like with my experience as someone who is neurodivergent, I kind of like, I kind of notice things that they're enjoy. So if someone's wearing like a dinosaur hat and they have like a, um, chew toy, not a chew toy, but like a, one of those chew necklaces on their neck. Yeah. I like to talk about dinosaurs with them. So kind of like that kind of helps me with that. Um, but for me, I kind of have to advocate for myself um, a little bit. I know that having stuff written down for me is really helpful. And then also printed out instructions about like what to do when, when stuff is like slow and like what I need to do as a supervisor at this store is really helpful. So it's, it's somewhat there, but it's still like a long ways away. I try and make, and make, my cowork like people who are work who work under me like make them able to come to me and ask any questions or like if they need help or anything i can help them in any sh shape or form i think this is all based in compassion and empathy like like yeah. for you know understanding where people are instead of saying oh this is weird or that person's weird or it's 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 under it, looking at at somebody for who they are and what they bring to the bring to the yeah. environment yeah um Okay. So that's great. So um, we hope that you have a great day at work, Julia. And I'm so glad you were able to join us and yeah. see your former uh, supervisor. Yeah. Um, oh, and, yeah. and, uh, you know, uh, have, you know, keep it up, keep up the good work, Julia. And I hope that you think about um, you see me all the time, so I can tell it to you anytime, <laughs> but um, I hope that you'll think about like maybe taking that passion for helping people. Yeah. You know, I could see you following in Adam's footsteps in terms of, you know, you know, working in education. Yeah, maybe. So, yeah. yeah, maybe. Who knows? Maybe. So I will decide about right what now. I want to do in life. So. Yeah, you've got all the time in the world. Yeah. All right. Thank all you, right. everybody. Thank okay. You. Thank you. We'll see you later. Bye. All right. So.
I'm so glad she could join us. I was yeah, I wasn't sure right. she was going to be be here today, but she's uh, I'm I'm proud of her and and she really learned a lot from Landmark and it's been a great experience. Um, so what is it like? Let's talk a little bit about um, students in general, like the programs for students in general. So if people aren't familiar, if you're a parent, um, you might be interested in knowing that they have high school programs and that sort of thing and and online mm -hmm. programs. Do you want to talk a little bit about that? Sure. It's, uh, I mean, Landmark College really is an institution that is growing and innovative. Um, but everything that we do really is centered on a word that you mentioned a, a moment ago, Lucy, and that's empathy. Yeah. We, we, I mean, too often our students get, uh, I mean, identified by their profile. And I mean, while profiles can be helpful, they oftentimes lead uh, to uh, in stereotyping. Um, and we know from uh, nearly 40 years of experience uh, I mean, as an institution that a profile only tells so much. You really have to talk with the student and get to know who they are as, a, as an individual, who what their experiences have been. I mean, so many of our students come to us after some really challenging uh, K-12 experiences where Frankly, education is the last thing they want to do. Um, there is a, what I call little T trauma. <laughs> um, and, uh, and it's uh, the trauma that it may not be an injury, it may not PT be PTSD, but it might. Um, it's, so we, we look at them as individuals and, and as part of that process, help them to understand and regain, uh, in some cases, that sense of worth, that sense of self-value. Uh, that's without that, I mean, what we do, it, it can only go so far. Um, so we have a lot of programs uh, in place to support students uh, in those, uh, I mean, to develop those self-understanding and, and reignite that passion for learning. Um, as an educator, my ultimate goal is to you know, re-inspire um, a lot of our students. So they are not only learning college, but they'll learn well beyond college, whether that's by through reading or watching film and documentaries or exploring life outside of their house. Uh, I mean, horticulture, I mean, I mean all of that. Um, lifelong learning is the critical piece. So, we, so our various programs, we, we try to meet students uh, and families um, at a variety of different entry points. I mean, certainly we have our undergraduate uh, degrees on campus, the, our associate's program, our bachelor's program that uh, are, I mean, really changed lives. Um, and that, I mean, there's lots of different opportunities for them to focus in on majors that are of interest or minors. It's uh, in the sciences, business, liberal arts, it goes on and on. Um, and, and but part of that is supporting students in not only their strengths uh, and areas of passion, which many of them have not had the opportunity to explore in depth in the past, um, but also supporting in them them in areas that may be a little bit more challenging for them, things that that, that may not be as fun, um, but uh, it's things that we believe and they believe that they can improve on, even if it's only incrementally. So are you are you referring to like the social programmatics program or having yeah. a coach like an executive functioning coach those kinds of yeah. kinds of services? I mean it could be social pragmatics um, and our peers program. Um, it can be uh, coaching um, uh, and executive function support. It could be writing and study skills um, that you know it's uh, they learned them, but they learned them in a, in a way that was forceful. Uh, that yeah. weren't given, they, they, they're expected to learn this and implement it rather than looking at them as individuals who, you know, some things will work for you, some things won't. Let's try to fill up your backpack with things so you have options. Um, so yeah. UDL comes into this. So uh, my impression is that every faculty member has been trained in UDL and yeah. is aware of it and, and is, can desi has designed their curriculum around it. Yeah, the thing, uh, I mean, we've sort of, I like to think in some ways we've moved beyond UDL. Okay. And it's not just a, a list of, uh, I mean, steps or that okay. checklist that sometimes okay. it becomes, uh, but it's really a mindset. 
it's really thinking about uh, I mean, how do we make things more accessible, uh, equitable, and inclusive? How do we do that in the classroom? How do we do that in our clubs and activities and programs that we offer? How do we do that in college admission? And really thinking broadly about, I mean, what does an accessible world look like? And I mean, we know from years and years of doing it that it looks slightly different depending on the person. Um, mm -hmm. you know, universal design is, is, is a bit of a misnomer um, in that, I mean, it, it, you're never going to be able to meet the needs of absolutely everyone, but you can mm -hmm. try. And by mm -hmm. doing mm -hmm. that, it, uh, it allows you to really hit what I consider the flip side of that coin. Universal design, you make things as, as accessible as possible from the, from the start, but there'll always be a need to individualize. Yeah. Not, and what universal design does is it gives you that capacity because most folks needs are being met, but it allows you that time to work one on one and individualize for students who are not being met by universal design. So we've sort of moved in that direction over the years um, where everyone uh, in, on campus understands universal design. Mm -hmm, we've, mm -hmm. we've all heard the the steps and we know the chat, the sort of the check box. The charts and, and, and yeah. 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 But it's we've sort of we've, we've tried to ingrain it more into so that we're not necessarily going step by step, but it's something that we just do naturally. It, yeah, it's not always thoughtful. But to be perfect. well, it, it it reminds me a little bit of like in the ed tech world. You know, we've used the SAMR model, um, mm -hmm. and you know, to talk about different levels of, of sophistication mm -hmm. using technology, and that gets to be very step-like. And, and, and the fact of the matter is that you're going up and down the, the SAMR mm -hmm. ladder. You know, um, sometimes you're gonna be doing really basic things. Other times you're gonna be hopefully doing more sophisticated integrated projects. So it, it's, it's not one thing is better than the other. It's, 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 lever it's applying the appropriate technologies at the, pro at the appropriate time in interesting ways. Okay. And, and so it kind of reminds me of of that but i think sometimes educators when they're new to something Absolutely. they need that basis but then hopefully yeah. they become so fluent in it it just becomes inherent in what they do Absolutely. and um you know the other piece of this too i'm thinking about my other child at landmark um my other student you know the other piece of it you can design all you want mm -hmm. to be make it as as interesting as possible for kids but there's still mm -hmm. A, a part where the kid has to, the student has to connect with that too. Okay. And so that's half the battle too. Like, you yeah. know, just because you design it well, doesn't mean everybody's going to, to, to mm -hmm. glom onto it right away. Um, you, but that's, that's the, that as educators, that's what we always hope for. That's the ultimate, right. It's like, how do we motivate? How do we engage? How do we um, get our students really involved with this? And, and, you know, I think, it's not it's it doesn't always happen it takes a while i think like like julia said too at landmark it took her a while to figure out what she was doing and i hear that from parents a lot in the there's a parent facebook group for landmark parents and a lot of parents are kind of freaking out like if their kid is not you know you know right away taking mm -hmm. advantage of all the amazing resources or not you know and and part of it is the, i think this is the other piece that's really critical for people to know about landmark it's about the student figuring it out not the parent mm -hmm. And we could talk about this for a long time. And I, I've learned the hard way of stepping back from my, my students and not, I, there's sometimes where I have to, um, I have to micromanage a little bit, but I think when you're the parent of a neurodiverse learner for years, you've been ingrained in advocating for that kid. Yeah. And then you, you can't let go <laughs> sometimes. And uh, so that's another interesting journey, yeah. I think, for, for families at, at Landmark is kind of getting accustomed to letting their kid figure it out. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. It's, uh, uh, I, I have the privilege of, all, of being both neurodivergent myself and raising mm -hmm. uh, two neurodivergent children. And it's parents have a hard job. It's, yeah. uh, it's uh, I mean, there's a lot that, have to, that has to be understood and fought for um, mm -hmm. when your children, especially when they're younger, to get them the basic services that they're entitled to. And when to. you're an educator and you know what the possibilities yeah. are. So oh, yeah. I, I, ended, I, I, I probably was more of a tiger mom, mm -hmm. you know, for, for Julia's first 14, 15 years. And then I've learned to kind of back off and it's, yeah. it's, if I could give advice to people with younger children, it would be like, you know, 
you know, try to try to hold back a little bit. Yeah. And I mean, one of the things that we're found that we've been finding in our research, and uh, I mean, I've had the privilege, as as, uh, as you all know, of working yeah. with Julia, but I also ha have worked with a number of other students. And uh, one of our students who I've been working with, uh, along with Mark Thurman, uh, our uh, director of our diversity, equity, and inclusion uh, program, is uh, I mean, has really been focused on that transition. And one of the interesting findings was about trust and how so many uh, of our students uh, and neurodivergent students come into higher education with I mean, being having questions about who they can trust, who, I mean, who yeah. will not share their information, who will not discriminate against them, who will, uh, when they offer support and they offer to help, what are their, what are their motives uh, behind that? Is it for to actually support or is it to, help them, uh, I mean, themselves as an educator. Yeah. It's, uh, so there's, there are some trust issues that have to really be um, figured out and explored in, the, in, that, in those early transition experiences before some of our students will even uh, consider accepting uh, the support that's being offered to them. Yeah, I, I, in our experience, I found that the kind of support maybe because it was IEP driven, it got to be about compliance. Oh, yeah. And uh, in, in, you know, younger grades in high school, particularly. And, you know, for example, we, our kids went to a great high school and, and had great people, you know, who were wanted to work with them um, and support them as much as possible. But there's, there's structures in place that have to be adhered to. And, you know, for example, one was, um, there, you know, there's like a study skills class in high school that my kids could take and uh, but didn't teach any study skills. There was no there was no curriculum for it. It was basically like a study hall with a teacher that was there to give individual help. Mm -hmm. But one of the things I found and, and Julia could probably I should have asked her about this a little bit because I know this is something that's of interest to her. Um, sometimes with neurodivergent children or, or maybe other kids too, learning how to advocate for yourself and how to ask for that help is like a huge thing. Mm -hmm. And I noticed that, you know, Julia had a friend uh, at Walcott that I mentioned earlier and, you know, at Walcott, they, they taught those skills explicitly to the kids. So the kids were really mm -hmm. um, confident in advocating for themselves and asking for help. I wish, you know, regular other public schools would do the same because I think that's, that's the biggest gift you can give a, a neurodiverse kid is the, the ability to be able to, to say to people, this is what I need. Yeah. Um, and, how does that work at, at Landmark? How do you help mm -hmm. students become more confident in that out of curiosity? Yeah, we, uh, we engage in a lot of different ways. Um, it's uh, cause it, it's not a one and done. I mean, it really is yeah. a, a process yeah. of developing and honing and refining, and refining, and then transferring what you've learned to different situations. Um, so we, we do use an explicit approach. Um, uh, I mean, as part of uh, the many ways we do it, um, we have a our sort of our foundational course is uh, called Perspectives in Learning. Uh -huh. And Perspectives in Learning is a course that we offer online um, as well um, as, as we do on campus. Uh, we offer it as part of our dual enrollment um, program for high school students. And we also offer it you know, as part of our um, uh, college start uh, online program, which uh, is, supports student in go students in going towards an associate's degree. Um, but in this course, it really is about exploring neurodiversity and learning disabilities and how they relate uh, to yourself. Um, it's, I mean, for so many of us, and I include myself in this, it's, we didn't learn about this stuff in, uh, in K-12. We didn't, uh, many of us did not have the opportunity to actually look at our IEP or our 504 and uh, be really Ask have any input? Have any input on it? Right. Exactly. It's, a, it's a very adult-centered or a, a document. Yeah. yeah. It's essentially what I mean. What I thought it was as a kid was okay. Just said you're disabled. That was it. But if yeah. you actually get into it, it's not just about areas of challenge. It yeah. also goes through all the things that you have strengths in. It talks about, I mean, different 
ways of learning and it's not just a singular, it, it, different facets. And that's exciting. That can open up opportunities. And for what we do is we help students first and foremost, learn about themselves. What are their strengths? What are their areas of challenge? What do they want out of life? I mean, a lot of them haven't been asked. A lot of yeah. them have been uh, in the system, uh, a cog in the system moving forward. Yeah. So we explore those things. We also explore their history, um, which frankly is everyone's history. I, I mean, remember Julia interviewing me, you know, yeah. asking me, you know, about her story because a lot of it mm -hmm. was sort of like her birth story and that sort of thing, which Absolutely. obviously she doesn't remember. Yeah. Absolutely. And uh, I mean, and along with that, we, we talk about, uh, I mean, disability and neurodiversity history at large, the things that are not included in the history books, um, yes, so yeah. that they really understand themselves, not only from that medical compliance model that, that you were referring yeah. to, but for, from that social, that cultural model, that we are a community, that we are a people, just like any other diversity group. So, I mean, we try to, we go through that very formally uh, in the perspectives and learning course. And as part of that uh, course, what all our students do is they, they identify the uh, I mean, strategies and the, and the tools that work for them. They practice talking about themselves uh, in, in both written and verbal form. And then the, the final, their final project is uh, them talking with a member of the landmark college community, generally who they don't know, and talking about themselves. What strategies have worked for them in the past? What, what are their strengths? What so are, it's, what scaffolded. Are it's scaffolded. It's scaffolded for them. You got it. And then, and then, and then that is where it, it really goes into the larger community, where uh, I mean, everyone of our faculty and staff are, are aware of the importance of, of building not self-advocacy, but more broadly self-determination for our students. Um, uh, I, I'm thinking of some of the students that I've seen when I've been, I've been through three orientations, one for Henry's summer program, and then when he came last fall, and then Julia's orientation. And convocation totally like was my favorite thing ever. Mm -hmm. And um, the first time with Julia, um, the kids, I have to describe this, the kids marched in and then all the faculty in their robes marched in and the kids were all smiling and beaming because they'd been through a day and a half or two of, of being together and talking about getting this journey started and all the parents are crying and cheering on the kids because they're like, oh, thank God I found a place for my, my child is going to be welcomed. And I, I'm getting teary thinking about this. I can I can see it now. And um, and John Elder Robeson, mm -hmm. uh, who is a fellow with the college. Yeah, he's a, a, a visiting scholar and a Center for Neurodiversity fellow. OK, OK. So he was talking about neurodiversity rules the world and you guys are going to go out and rocket and 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 then every student is given and he was amazing. He's neurodiverse himself. Then every student was given a coin to remember. And if if you are if and anybody's listening, if you ever go and listen to the president of the college, he's hilarious, and he connects with the kids really well. And and so he had you know some choice words for the kids that were that were great. But it was like such a feeling of joy and uh, acceptance. Um, it was really, really, really powerful. And there was something else I was going to say about this. The, oh, some of the students that also spoke at these at these convocations were amazing. And so the power of role models, the, po the power of students who've been there for a while, who've really blossomed for the mm -hmm. other students, I think I imagine must be pretty powerful too. It's like, oh, yeah. there's some pretty amazing students there. Yeah, it's, uh, I mean, John, I work with John uh, Elder Robeson regularly and he happens to live maybe five minutes away from it. Um, so, but when, I, when he comes to campus, I, I tend to be the one who uh, I mean, meets with him when he arrives and do, does those things. And every time he says, he says, Adam, you, as someone who's here every day, you don't get it. This is the only place you can go in the world where you have this many out neurodivergent people <laughs> for this length of time. He's like, I come here and all of a sudden the stress and the anxiety just melts away. I can be 
myself. And then John says, not that I'm not myself anyway, <laughs> but, yeah. but it's uh, it's just a different vibe. What, I mean, our, our faculty and our staff, many identify as neurodivergent. Yeah. Many have children uh, or family members who are neurodivergent, but we're all allies. Um, and that is felt on campus. And it just, there's a hope, an optimism that you hear from day one from those role models, those yeah. folks who have had difficult times, but have persevered and are working towards their dreams. I mean, that's that's the inspiration. It's it's one thing for an old guy like me to to tell students like, yeah, you can get there. It's it's very different having someone who is a recent uh, alum uh, like Julia or. A, one of our assistantship students, who, uh, uh, staff members, who's a recent graduate, who's working on campus, really in that sort of mentorship role, or I um, mean, a fellow student who's towards the end of their year, or frankly, even a student who's in their second semester and said, you know, that was hard as heck that first semester. Yeah. You know what? I did it. I did yeah. Um. So for people who aren't familiar with uh, this, I did not know this show. Let me, oops, sorry. Let's see if I can, I have the link here. Um, uh, Landmark was featured on a, a YouTube show. I don't know if it's a YouTube show, if it's on TV too. Um, the College Tour. Uh, yeah. do you, so tell, can you tell us about that? Uh, that was kind of a fun thing. Yeah, um, that, was, that was really fun. Um, so uh, the college tour is on Amazon, um, okay. and it's, it is this wonderful show uh, where they visit a different campus, uh, I mean, several different campuses each season. Uh, it's, uh, I mean, the University of Vermont has been on it, uh, the University of Connecticut, uh, I, mean, I mean, and a whole host of other colleges uh, and universities, and Landmark got to be featured. And one of the things is they were uh, sort of preparing us to, I mean, film the different interviews and uh, things of that nature. I just remember them, the, their team saying, wow, like, this is such a remarkable and unique campus. And we're so excited that we get to feature it. Um, but I mean, as you, when you see the final product, which really strikes me is that I mean, while you will see the faculty and staff, yeah. you'll hear from the students. Yeah. Yeah. They are the stars. They are, they hear about their experience. And as a parent uh, I mean, of neurodivergent children, it's like, wow. I mean, look, look where my student, my child uh, will be one day. Look where they'll be able to get to. Um, I, uh, there was one student on it that, that, I, that, I always, that I always tell them that, you know, you're, you're the, you're my inspiration. You're what I hope one day that my child will achieve. Um, and uh, I believe it. I've, I've seen you do it and I believe he can get there too. It's, uh, I mean, it's, I'm inspired by our students and, and the college tour episode on Landmark uh, College is, you know, one that, uh, that inspires me as an educator. Yeah. Um, and it's fine. Everybody should check it out. It's great. Oh, yeah. um, we've got a couple comments from mm -hmm. people who, in questions. And one of them is from, I'm going to put this up here, from Matt. Um, he, You mentioned working with employers to prepare them for neurodivergent employees. Do Landmark students have internship programs? And how does, how does preparation differ for internships versus jobs versus careers? That's a really good question, Matt. That's an excellent question. Um, we try to do it from every facet we possibly can. We do offer, I mean, certainly I do, a lot of my role is working with employers directly um, and for helping them to build programs uh, at, their, at their workplace and uh, train their folks. Um, but my colleague, Jan Copeland, um, our director of Career Connections, her team and I, we partner a lot. Uh, we do a lot of work together on that Workplace Neurodiversity Summit um, we so we we're working in collaboration, but we uh, part of my work is to really collaborate with Jan on trying to develop more and more opportunities for internships at different organizations. 
we have a very, uh, very much a scaffolded approach to um, career preparation and career development. Uh, we have programs called the Employment Readiness Experience, where there's direct instruction and explicit instruction that's, you know, that our students will get. And then they'll work for a couple of weeks, uh, I mean, usually during our January break in an office. Um, and that's usually for our students who may not have had prior employment experiences, may never have volunteered because most of their K-12 education was focused on simply getting through the academic portion. Yeah. Um, so we're helping them to develop skills, uh, I mean, uh, like the core foundational workplace skills in the employment readiness experience. We then go on to do um, various uh, on-campus internships. Uh, and I, That's what Julia did. Yep. Yeah, uh, I mean, this coming semester, I have seven different internship students that I'm working with. Oh, wow. Uh, so on top of everything else. <laughs> oh yeah, in in my spare time. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, but it's something that I wouldn't give up uh, if you paid me. Um, it's it, I see this as the opportunity to really help students uh, maybe take that next step in their own journey. Um, and then we work with students to pursue external internships, whether they're external local uh, internships or whether they're. I mean, we're in Vermont, whether they're in California or Rhode Island, what have you. Um, we have a, a nice network of uh, employers uh, that we have uh, MOUs with that we know are prepared to receive neurodivergent folks. So I, we... I, I noticed that there's a new program for virtual internships too. I just put the link in the chat. There was a, mm -hmm. somebody posted to the parent group too as well. And it, it sounds like Matt, Matt, whoops, I'm going to the wrong tab here. Um, hang on a second here. Okay. There we go. Sorry. I'm clicking on 5 million tabs and they're starting to play. Um, it sounds like Matt is from an internship group too. So Matt, um, you know, tell us a little bit more in the chat about what your network does and, and maybe you guys can connect as well. Absolutely. And I can certainly put you in touch with Jan in particular, who does a lot of the individual work with uh, connecting students with individual uh, employers. That's great. Okay. And then we've got another one from uh, Jen Klein. She's written a book called The Landscape of Model Learning. And the inter she and her partner interviewed Kristen Pelletier from the International School of Brussels. They have a whole self-advocacy curriculum, and she made a point of saying that every child is in a different place and that age does not determine how ready they are to advocate for themselves. So Jen was mentioning that she agrees with you. It's not a simple step-by-step -step that everyone will move through in the same way. Great point, Jen. Excellent point. Absolutely not. It's, uh, yeah, I mean, we have, I mean, even with my own children, I mean, I, I start giving opportunities for them to self-advocate early on. And looking at my two boys, it, it took one a lot longer than the other to even be willing to say a preference. Um, yeah. and, uh, so it's it's one of those things you might, I mean, you could get it in adolescence. You could get it, uh, I mean, I mean, later in life or sometimes, unfortunately, I mean, not everybody does get it. Um, we have to factor in a whole wide variety of cultural factors. And sometimes it's not about, I, I found working with, uh, I mean, in, in other cultures that it's not about self-advocacy. Sometimes it's about family advocacy. Um, uh, so it, 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 it's, it's, a, it's different for different people. Um, so Jennifer follows up with saying that she, you know, she, this woman at the International School of Bru uh, Brussels mm -hmm. said that she had second graders who can advocate for their needs, but high school kids who still struggle. Mm -hmm. it, it's a it's a lifelong process, right? I think for, for everyone to kind of figure this stuff out. Mm -hmm. um, Julia mentioned to me at one point, and I don't know if, if I if I understood her correctly, but she said that you have other colleges coming to to um, landmark to study the population there because it's a large concentration of neurodiverse students. Mm -hmm. She said that there are people coming from Ivy League colleges to do work yeah. there. Is that how, how does that work? I'm, I'm curious yeah. about that. So it, it works very carefully. I'll be honest. With you. <laughs> um, we don't want our students to, I mean, feel in in any way that they are 
research subjects, quote unquote. They're guinea pigs. Uh, that's, exactly. That's not, we don't ever want that. Um, okay. So we are very careful about who will actually allow um, to come and work with, I mean, work independently, which is rare. Um, it's usually work with uh, my department, the Landmark College Institute for Research and Training. Um, and there, when we do allow those types of things, it's very important that there be opportunities for them to give back to our community and in particular our students. Um, so when we do have those opportunities, we oftentimes will have research assistants who will, our students who will work with uh, those groups. So we had a, a partnership with the Dartmouth Autism Research Initiative, um, or DARI, uh, and they were doing uh, uh, perception uh, research on uh, I mean, how autistic students perceive different stimuli. And we had, we said, okay, I mean, uh, it's, it's, a, it's an important research question, but it's important that we have an opportunity for that to serve our students. Uh, right. So uh, we had one student who was part of that uh, that research project. Actually, we had we had two, I should say, uh, at different semesters. Um, and uh, that one student, I mean, one of the students was able to, I mean, fell in love with the work, leveraged yeah. it into and used it as part of his application for graduate school. Um, and is now currently pursuing doctoral education. Um, wow. Yeah, well, we had another student who uh, I mean, was working um, with, uh, it was actually an external company called Turk, um, which is an educational gaming yeah. company. And uh, I mean, he ended up, he did, was doing some research with them uh, as they were collecting uh, I mean, re working with us to do work on virtual reality on campus, he ended up securing a job with them um, and is now working in uh, uh, augmented reality uh, research and game design. Um, we do work with the University of Massachusetts. We've worked with Thomas Jefferson University out of Philadelphia. Yeah. I have one, one student who's doing work with me. Uh, in partnership with my own alma mater, uh, Hamilton College in Central New York. Um, shout out to Hamilton. Um, yeah. So it's again, there's really, I mean, we are very careful about who we partner with, and yeah. want to make sure that in those projects we are able to give uh, learning opportunities to our uh, to our students. Oh, that's great. That's great. To, that's really good to know. So yeah. that if anybody's listening and wants to partner and and uh, you know, things of projects that you could work potentially collaborate on, then yep. this is good information. Um, so we're getting to the top of the hour, so I don't want to take up too much of your time, but I'm wondering if you, if, if anybody has any more questions, feel free to throw them in the chat and we'll try to get to them uh, in the next two minutes. Um, but in the next few minutes, why don't you give us, um, what is your, what would your, your, advice be to students who are neurodivergent going to college? Yeah. And what would your advice be for parents of neurodivergent children going to college? Um, I think that would be, um, I think that would be really helpful to, to everyone. Absolutely. It's a, and transition to college happens to be my, uh, my thing. So uh, I'm excited for this question. You know, it's, the first thing is that I want folks to know is that it's possible. Um, so many uh, parents and children uh, and students that I, that I know and have interacted with over the years um, have unfortunately given it, given up on it uh, because they didn't think it was possible. Now, it may not be the right decision for every, every student, and I, and I understand that. Uh, I, mean, they're, I mean, some students might want to go right to work. Uh, I mean, might, they might have a passion for, for industry and might want to go there. But students shouldn't be taking it, and parents shouldn't be taking it off the table if it's something that's truly desired. Um, go through the process. Um, it's, uh, now, with that, with that said, I mean, the best strategies that I can, uh, that I can give families and uh, I mean, students is really to do your homework. And homework takes time. Um, it takes planning. And uh, executive function skills, as we know, I mean, those higher order processes needed 
for goal-directed behavior like planning and time management sometimes or let me just say it's a struggle for all of us right? but we know it's a particular struggle for many of our neurodivergent students so i mean looking at different strategies and using the supports that are available with your school um, and most importantly starting ahead so that when you do stumble like i did you will be able to recover and still have the time um, so those are, I mean, I would certainly suggest that. The other thing is, uh, I mean, when you're investigating your institutions, um, certainly look at the majors, certainly look at the dorms and the, the food and the athletics team, if you're someone like me, uh, how good are they, how is their football team? Um, but also take a look at the uh, disability resources office. Um, look at things like uh, the academic support services. What do they offer? Because they vary from institution to institution. Some institutions might have a single person doing all of accessibility as like a 50% part of their job portfolio. Other institutions might have 50 people. They vary. Uh, but what that means is the focus that it will be placed on it at that institution. How hard will it be to get an appointment when you need one? Um, if someone only is doing it for four hours a day, it's a little bit more challenging. Um, so look at the resources, look what's available. Um, and even if your child doesn't choose to uh, identify as a, uh, a person with a disability uh, at their institution, certainly make sure that there are those other support services like coaching or counseling or tutoring uh, because in some of the research that i've done with some of my colleagues we found that that's uh, a pretty good predictor of college success for neurodivergent students as well um, so if, i certainly encourage registering but if you don't make sure there are at least the the other services available i think that's you know one thing that we did not touch on is um is the is COVID an impact on on students at at, at uh, Landmark and other places? And I think, um, you know, I think we're going to see that for a while. I think people are reporting that kids are a little bit more detached and and uh, there are more behavior issues in schools mm -hmm. in general and that sort of thing. Um, and and so I think that. I think checking into those services that you're mentioning, um, seeing what's available, like I know mental health is readily available. Yeah. Counseling is r readily available at Landmark for students, I think is really critical and getting kids comfortable with saying, yes, I need this kind of support because right now, you know, with my younger child, you know, he was in the throes of the, of the pandemic when this, um, mm -hmm. you know, it, he's a junior in high school. And I think those kids are, are particularly impacted. I put a couple of resources in, and if you have any other ones that you can think of, Adam, too, for families, um, I put understood.org in the chat. And then um, in terms of looking at colleges, what was helpful to us was our post-secondary at Glenbrook North. Um, we had a great post-secondary coordinator who worked with us and uh, he knows about Landmark. He knows about Beloit. He knows he's, he's on all these, on these great schools. And um, the, he's also involved with this post-secondary choices uh, conference or, or fair for families. And we went to that, I think with Julia as well. So that's another resource for people. I don't know if they do that in other states. I think it's just a local group. Um, but if you're, you know, I think half the battle is is finding resources and networking and talking to other families and figuring out where you're going with all this. Um, and, and sometimes you find people in schools like we did at Glenbrook who were helpful in terms of pointing us in the right direction. Um, any, any other resources before we close, Adam, that you would recommend? Yeah, I mean, certainly, uh, I mean, the book that I published with two landmark college uh, faculty and staff members, uh, Disability to Diversity, yeah. that you posted earlier is one. But I'm also um, uh, including a book uh, right now from a colleague of mine, um, Elizabeth Hamlet, uh, who has been writing about uh, college transition and success for she won't want me to say how many. Wow, that was a long length. <laughs> there, um, it's a, it's a new book. Um, okay. She uh, it just came out. Uh, it's, I mean, I 
<laughs> I had the pleasure of reading it on the beaches on Cape Cod. Um, yeah. And <laughs> what I do in my spare time. Uh, yeah. But it's a tremendous resource that really goes into some good information. Um, it's uh, it's it's called uh, Seven Steps to College Success: A Pathway for Students with Disabilities. And I just think the world of Elizabeth uh, and her work. So that would be a great resource. Okay, that's great. Um, uh, it's awesome. Um, so I hope this was useful to people and and that you'll uh, if you're watching this post event that you'll connect with Adam um, if you want to collaborate in any way or learn more about Landmark. It is a really, truly a special place. And we're as a family, we're really grateful um, for the college. And we're particularly grateful to you and how you supported Julia. So thank you. Thank you. My pleasure. Um, and then let me just pull up a couple things. Here's Adam's name, and uh, and and I and I we can throw his if he wants to he can throw his email in the chat. I don't want to give that away, um, but thank you, Adam, for being here. We really, really, really appreciate it. Um, our next thing, just to remind you, in that's this is not our next thing, but we have a big thing coming in November, which is a, a global learning for an open world. Um, it's a virtual conference here in Hop In. We're taking proposals for it. It is um, historically, we've done this for 10, 11 years now in various forms. And it's really a great community if you're interested in globally connected teaching and learning um, and innovation too. We've kind of broadened our mission a little bit. So that's coming up and we would love to have people involved with that. Um, and then you can follow us on at linktree slash actionable NO. Um, that's where you can find links to our various social media channels and so on and so forth. And I think that's it for now. Um, but I just want to make sure that everybody had that information. And um, to get to the recording, it will, I will send out an email. Um, it's, it's up and in, in, it'll be up on YouTube immediately, but you can also come back if you registered and hop in, you can come back in once I publish it and it, there'll be a button that says replay and you can click on that and watch the whole thing as well. So um, thanks for coming. Uh, we appreciate everything that you've done, Adam and everyone who's here. Thank you for being here and we'll see you September 6th at our next one. Thanks for coming. I'm going to end the broadcast right now, but Adam, you can stick around. <laughs>